2023 was a historical year for gaming, with some major events that shook the industry to some massively innovative releases, it was filled with a lot of good and a lot of bad. With that being said though, I've selected 5 games that were some of my favorites to release last year, for reasons that you'll find out soon enough. Some of these picks may surprise you, most of them probably won't. The bad news is, there were a few huge releases that I didn't play this year, so I apologize if one of your favorites wasn't on this list. The good news is that everything I say in this video will be 100% objective fact, and in no way laced with my own opinions or personal biases. Enough with that though, let's get into the games. First up we have Redfall, wait, wait, no, no, Remnant 2. Remnant 2 is a third-person action RPG with a focus on exploration and combat. You'll hear many people write off the series as just Dark Souls with guns, and while yes, it is a Souls-like, and yes, you do have guns, there's a lot more to it than that. There's a wide variety of classes called archetypes. These have different perks and abilities like a stealth class, healer, tank, summoner, and so many more. You'll start the game with one of four and gradually discover ways to unlock the other 11 as you play, which you can freely swap out with your starting archetype as well as equip a secondary whenever you'd like. Remnant 2 also places a very big emphasis on its co-op features. One problem I find that most Souls-likes have is that they're balanced very poorly for playing with multiple people. That's not the case here. This game was built around its co-op play. The bosses and various combat encounters are balanced very well for both solo and co-op. My entire first playthrough was with a friend, and I had a blast. The world still presented a challenge, but not punishingly so aside from a few bosses. It wasn't too hard, it wasn't too easy, and progression was very well balanced around having several people playing at the same time. It's balanced just as well though for solo play. After my initial co-op playthrough, I've since played through the entire game alone, and it's just as good. The game consists of five major worlds that you'll travel to throughout your playthrough. It uses procedural generation to change each run by altering both the order you'll go to these huge realms and also what you see when you explore them. However, that doesn't mean the entire world is procedurally generated, like in Deep Rock Galactic for example. Each world has a huge pool of dungeons or locations that may or may not show up during your playthrough, and each of these locations are for the most part entirely handcrafted by the developers. What this instead means is that only a handful of these specific dungeons will show up during any given run, meaning you'll likely have to play through certain worlds again to see everything. Rather than playing through each world in a somewhat linear order like in the story mode, Remnant 2's adventure mode is a separate thing that allows you to choose one of the five worlds and roll a run on that world which will include a random pool of world drops and dungeons. You can use whatever character you'd like, even the one you progress through the story on, and since it's separate it will not affect your current story progress. You can also reroll the story. This means that you can sort of curate what bosses you want to fight for different rewards or what dungeons you want to see, stuff like that. The game also has a ridiculous amount of secrets, some of which that you can't see through your first time anyway. This can be anything from secret bosses to lore to items and new weapons, even to whole new classes you can play. Using the sprawling catalog of classes, weapons, rings, amulets, armor, and such, there are also a ton of wacky builds that you can cook up to really express the way that you want to play. Remnant 2 was one of my favorite games that I played last year, and I had an amazing time playing through it over and over again. Coming from someone who doesn't usually replay this game, I can almost guarantee that this game will hook you for dozens, maybe even hundreds of hours. Next up is Mortal Sin. A lot of games with melee combat have a really hard time getting it right, especially in first person. It either doesn't function particularly well, or maybe it gets the job done but it doesn't feel that great, but Mortal Sin is not one of those games. Mortal Sin is a first person roguelike centered around its meaty melee combat. With about a million weapons to use and try out, you can combo many variations of attacks in between kicks, punches, dashes, and more. It uses its dark fantasy setting perfectly. The downright insane visual style works very well with its strange enemies and horrific locations. There are unlockable classes as well, each with their own perks and unique weapons. You can cleave through enemies with massive two-headed axes or beat them over the head with a magic staff, it's really up to you. The way progression works in Mortal Sin is also pretty interesting. 
Essentially, there are three main stages with several levels within them. Depending on the order that you do these stages in, you will receive different rewards, anything from weapons to abilities to new mechanics. Outside of these rewards, these will scale in difficulty and enemy volume while you play as well. In between the main stages, you'll also encounter hidden and challenge stages that you could do for special upgrades and rewards. Given by the game's NPC, some stages will also have an optional challenge you can complete for even more rewards and additional dialogue. This game will not be for everyone, I'll admit that. It's challenging, but it's also very satisfying. If the visual style isn't really your thing, Mortal Sin also gives you a couple options to mess around with it. There are several different color palettes you can choose from, which is more for personal preference, but on top of that, you can also change things like the grain, the blending, and more to make it a little bit easier on the eyes. While I'm a big fan of Mortal Sin's unique visuals, I recognize that a lot of people aren't, so it's nice to see that the developer gives us some options. Speaking of that developer, his name is Nikola Todorovic. He's undoubtedly one of the most responsive developers that I've personally seen. In a video on Mortal Sin that I posted last year, I touched on this, but I'd like to do it again. There's a Mortal Sin Discord where anyone can just talk or give feedback or suggestions, and the developer is very active on there. I see people ask a lot of questions there all the time, and they never go unanswered. It's very nice to see a solo developer so active with their community, and I think that plays a large part in why I and so many other people enjoy the game so much. In the short time that the game's been out, it's received a ton of huge changes and additions, and I don't see signs of that stopping anytime soon. Overall, despite being a relatively simple game, Mortal Sin is both very fun and really stands out in the games that I played last year. Next up is Lies of P. I'm currently working on a more in-depth video on this, so I'm going to be a little more reserved with this section. But anyways, here we go. Lies of P is one of the two games that I'm still torn between calling my personal game of the year, the other of which we'll discuss in a little bit. This game came out of absolutely nowhere for me, as I feel like it did for a lot of people. From a relatively no-name South Korean developer, this game is flooring. There are a lot of Souls-likes out there, and most of the ones put out by anyone other than you-know-who are usually pretty bad. Lies of P does pretty much everything right, though. It has a more straightforward story than most high-profile Souls games, which doesn't make it inherently better, but it does contribute to why I enjoyed it so much. The world is gorgeous, the level design is amazing, and the boss philosophy never fails, which is, unfortunately, very rare. While most Souls games have a decent helping of great bosses, just about all of them also happen to have a good few that are just so terrible. This has the most consistent run of bosses in just about any Souls game. While not all of them are amazing, they are all great, and at worst, good, except for one. This genre is also praised for its use of impressive enemy variety. Even with this being one of the genre's most notorious features, Lies of Peace stands out. Rather than just making enemies to fight throughout the game, there are three major factions, all of which stay very close to a certain theme and have a place within the world. Each faction is contextualized very well and also has a good helping of enemies. Some of these will literally show up one time, maybe twice in the entire game, and were created just for those single encounters. Despite some enemies showing up only a handful of times, their movesets are also quite varied, and I'd argue that even some basic enemies have wider movesets than a couple actual bosses in some mainline Souls games. Not only does this game shine in the enemy department, it also expands on the player's options as well. Where the combat in Lies of Peace shines is the amount of options that it gives to the player. When you get a new weapon, you receive two pieces, the head and the handle. The only exception to this is boss weapons. This game throws a lot of weapons at you, and with no exception, you can combine any head and any handle to create your own weapon. Some, obviously, work better than others, but the point is you have the option to do whatever you want. This extends into how you respond to enemies attacking you. A big thing in Souls is the whole idea of blocking versus dodging. For example, most Souls games make it quite inefficient to play around shields or blocking compared to dodging, mainly due to the sacrificing of damage or stamina because of recoveries or not being able to two-hand weapons. Sekiro changed things up, making it so that the way you beat just about every encounter was by blocking and parrying. Lies of P makes the very intelligent decision to allow both to be very viable options. Blocking makes you lose some health temporarily, meaning you'll have to attack the target to regain that health. If you get hit again or just wait too long, you'll lose that health permanently. 
If you block right before an attack will hit you, it will result in a perfect guard, which is this game's version of parrying. Parrying is for players who want to master the game. It's there as a high risk, high reward form of blocking, and if you're really good at it, can even be more effective than dodging. All of these are here to give the player even more choices. It allows you to vary your responses to enemies' attacks in ways that fit your playstyle and level of comfort with the game. I'm not going to go too much longer, but basically, Lies of P is amazing, and you should play it. Another one of my favorites is RoboQuest. RoboQuest is a game that I've been following for quite a long time, deep into its early access journey. Much like Mortal Sin, this game has gone through a ton of changes since I started playing, all of which are definitely for the better. This is another one I've talked about several times, and for good reason. RoboQuest is a blast. It's incredibly fast-paced and requires a lot of attention to excel. Using a healthy mixture, using a healthy mixture of your robot's abilities as well as ranged and melee weapons alike, you will mow through countless hostile bots as you progress through each stage. Combined with its heart-pounding original soundtrack, this creates a thrilling game loop with constant progression through upgrades to your kit and weapons alike. As you gain experience, you'll level up, which gives you the power to augment your abilities. These upgrades and your playstyle will vary greatly depending on which class you choose to play. There are currently six, each of which plays rather differently and allows you to build your character in fun ways that complement how you choose to engage in combat. Boiled down to its most basic level, this game is just plain fun. The systems aren't particularly deep on their own, but with the weapons and classes and progression and whatnot, it all pulls together to create something a bit more complex. Traveling through each stage, you'll be heavily invested in finding all the secrets in each level while also optimizing your run, trying to eliminate all the enemies while blitzing to the finish to get that S rank. Based on the overall grade that you get on each stage, which factors in the time it took you to beat that and the amount of enemies you killed, you'll get a certain amount of wrenches, which serves as the main currency. You can use these at the workshop and base camp to forge new upgrades. This can be new NPCs, a new set of gadgets, weapon quality upgrades, things like that. On each subsequent run, you'll likely be getting further and further, discovering new bosses, new areas, and new secrets. Combined with all the new stuff that you'll be finding and base camp upgrades, this gives a constant progression that really lends to the just one more run feeling that you'll get from playing. RoboQuest is downright addicting. The gameplay is smooth, the boss and enemy variety is vast, but not overwhelming, and the secrets are hidden just enough to make every discovery just a few steps away from the next. Despite its surface level simplicity, it fits with its charming visual style, references, and characters. RoboQuest is a great game for fans of roguelikes or people who want to sit back and play and play and play. I should mention that the game is also very compatible in co-op. I can't vouch for its co-op myself because I don't have any friends who own this one, but you know, that's life. Regardless, it's an amazing time even on your own, so let's give this game the credit it deserves. Finally, we have my other top game of the year contender, Alan Wake 2. I already have a fairly in-depth video on the game, which I will highly urge you to go check out, but I'll do my best in brief to explain what I like about it so much. Without a doubt, one of, if not the most immersive games I've ever played, Alan Wake 2 does a fantastic job at contextualizing all of its gameplay elements into its story. Every single thing that happens and you can do yourself all makes perfect sense within the world, and because of that, you'll often find yourself very invested in its characters and story events. I'm not the biggest fan of the first game, but I do quite enjoy Quantum Break and especially Control, so I was somewhat worried going in, but Remedy just completely nailed it here. Taking all the lessons that they learned from everything between Max Payne and Control, I don't think a developer's design philosophy has changed in such a unique way. With a lot of complex characters all contained to this complex story with a lot of moving parts, it's just fun to piece all of its abstract information together on your own. The game follows Saga Anderson, an FBI agent, and of course, Alan Wake. While their two stories are connected, the two characters are sort of doing their own thing under this big umbrella that is the overarching story. Because of this, it's structured in such a way that has you swapping between them to experience each of their stories in parts. This is not a unique thing to Alan Wake 2, but it does fit this game extraordinarily well. Despite each character's chapters being somewhat disjointed, all of the pieces that do bridge the gap between their stories are done so, so well. Early on, it's sort of a barrage of information and moments that don't really make a lot of sense, or stuff that does and then it gets new meaning later, but the more you play, the better that these moments are. The game also combines many different mediums of entertainment, my favorite examples being live action film and its amazing use of music. 
Where most games try to stick to what they do best, Alan Wake 2 does a complete 180 and chooses to embrace the opposite. Even just the decision to branch out into these other mediums makes the game more impressive, but the fact that it's actually done so well makes it even better. Remedy also expanded greatly on gameplay, further fleshing out the mechanics of the first Alan Wake while introducing so many new ones that makes the game a creative and technical marvel. Most importantly, Alan Wake 2 is clearly a project born from passion. Every element of this game is just oozing with love, from its performances to every detail and every person involved in the project. Alan Wake 2 is simultaneously a game that needs more people to play it and a game that more people themselves need to experience. Before we close this one out, I have a couple of honorable mentions. For most improved, we have Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty. More than just a DLC, Phantom Liberty overhauled just about every major system in Cyberpunk. The bugs have been fixed and the gameplay is better than ever. Give it another chance if you're looking for a good RPG with a great story. For most um, stimulating, Warhammer 40k Bolt Gun. A great retro FPS with a ton of fun weapons and fantastic level design, this will make your neurons activate without fail. For the highest Risk of Rain award, this goes to Risk of Rain Returns. A lot of people seem to have an aversion to remakes and sometimes sequels being in the game awards. Um, personally, I think that's an exceedingly stupid reason to not nominate something, but I piss enough people off already, so that's why this wasn't in the main show. Risk of Rain Returns is a remake of the 2013 classic Risk of Rain. On top of a ton of new content, it's also got a beautiful fresh coat of paint. Lastly, for the honorable mentions, is the Most Evil Award, going to Resident Evil 4 Remake. This is another one that, again, was one of my favorite games of the year, but I'm not going to include it because it's a remake. It's no secret that I'm a fan of the series, and this one is no exception. This game is perfect. Uh, that's all I feel the need to say. This one is going to get its own review in the future as well, so I'll leave it at that. In the meantime, check it out. That is just about everything that I have for you guys today. I hope this, I don't know, opened your eyes, I guess. Um, but yeah, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe. Make sure that you also comment what your favorite games were this year. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night, and I'll catch you in the next one.